Good morning to those joining us on the West Coast of the United States, and good afternoon and evening to those audience members joining from America's East Coast, from the Republic of Ireland, from Northern Ireland and beyond. My name is Dermot Ryan, the Director of Irish Studies, and on behalf of Loyola Marymount University, I'm honored and excited to be welcoming you to today's conversation between the former Taoiseach of Ireland, Bertie Ahern, and LMU's Visiting Fellow of Irish Studies, Connor Euston, as part of our commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. As I'm sure will be reiterated by our speakers today, the Belfast Accords, which brought a degree, an invaluable degree of peace and nonviolence to Northern Ireland, represent both an achievement to be celebrated and a foundation on which we must build. This week, as we remember the tireless efforts of Taoiseach Ahern and countless others who helped make the seemingly impossible a reality, we also need to look to the future and identify the work ahead of us, not only to secure peace and democracy in Northern Ireland, but also to bring inclusion and prosperity to all those who live on the island of Ireland. To that end, I invite all of you to the Future of Peace work this coming Thursday, April 11th at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. At this, web, at this webinar, Connor will facilitate a conversation between a group of LMU students who traveled to Northern Ireland as part of Professor Maura Ford and Jennifer Ramos' course, Peace and Conflict, and a group of young leaders and activists from the island of Ireland. This rising generation of leaders will share their concerns and aspirations regarding the future of peace building efforts in Northern Ireland and beyond. We hope to see you then. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand the mic, the virtual mic over to Connor. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing this conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dermot. And uh, good morning to all of our friends in Los Angeles and across the West Coast and right across the United States. Uh, and I'm delighted we're, we're joined by guests uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And I, I get to use a line that I've been wanting to use for some time that uh, we're going from Hollywood to Hollywood uh, today. Uh, for those of you in Hollywood, Los Angeles, I am sitting in Hollywood County Down up in uh, Northern Ireland. And I am uh, very honored today to be joined by former Taoiseach of Ireland, uh, Bertie Ahern, who I, I'll introduce in just a moment. And we're so grateful to you uh, Tisha Kerr, uh, Bertie, for, for giving your time to be with us this morning uh, or this evening. Um, I feel like uh, the, the Heaney expression of the original centre feels opposite today because uh, on the 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, I had the honour of giving uh, a lecture at LMU reflecting on 20 years of the agreement. And it's very special to uh, be back at LMU five years on uh, reflecting on this, the 25th anniversary of the agreement. And I'm very grateful to Dermot Ryan and Professor Vicky Graff at Irish Studies for all the work that they've done in uh, building Irish Studies over the last number of years and in creating this uh, visiting fellowship. And the visiting fellowship, I've had the honor of being the first visiting fellow of Irish Studies, which is really about trying to build relationships between contemporary island of Ireland and uh, the west coast of the United States and particularly in Los Angeles and over the last number of years been very very fortunate to visit LMU and LA and to build some great relationships across community, business, civic society and the film industry and the tech industry uh, and so grateful to so many friends like Kieran Hannan and Harry Hartford and of course the wonderful Maureen Kendall who I know are all joining us today. Thank you to each of you and to the, the Irish American Bar Association, all, all our friends who have supported this fellowship program, particularly to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Consul General Marcel Smith, who have been phenomenal advocates of uh, this visiting fellowship and in building relationships between uh, the island of Ireland and uh, the United States. But today uh, is uh, the opportunity to hear from one of the key architects of our peace process and indeed of the Good Friday Agreement. And it's a distinct honor to have the former Taoiseach, former Prime Minister of Ireland, Bertie Ahern, who was Taoiseach of Ireland from 1997 to 2007, and who was, uh, as I say, one of the leading architects on behalf of the Irish government 
in terms of bringing about the Good Friday Agreement and, of course, crucially, ensuring its early implementation, which was by no means easy. Uh, so I'm very grateful to you, Bertie, for, for being with us today. And of course, yesterday marked the actual 25th anniversary. So it's particularly special to have you with us literally uh, in the week of the 25th anniversary. And I know there's a number of events taking place across the island of Ireland, most notably President Biden uh, visiting us this week and, and of course events at Queen's University next week. So uh, I know you'll be kept busy in, in reflecting uh, on the agreement. But uh, what I wanted to do today is, is to hear from you and I suppose to, to break it into sort of, I suppose, three parts. One, to, to sort of reflect on where we have been. Uh, the second is to look at where we're at now. And the third is to look at maybe where we're going to go. And uh, I know recently, Brody, you were at an event with uh, Professor Deirdre Heenan from Ulster University, who is a good friend who, who talked about the three R's of recognition, reform and reconciliation. And I'm going to slightly uh, steal those those themes, but we'll, we'll, rather than recognition, I thought we'd start with reflecting because, of course, the 25th anniversary or the anniversary of anything is an opportunity to reflect. And uh, I would love to go back and tell the 14 year old teenager who was glued to the television the weekend of Easter 1998 that 25 years later he'd be interviewing uh, Bertie Ahern uh, uh, for, for an audience in Los Angeles. It wouldn't have seemed possible, but I suppose that, that my memory of that weekend as a teenager, that formative time was a sense of hope and how somehow something that seemed to be impossible was suddenly made possible. Um, so I suppose to start, uh, Bertie, I'd love to hear your reflections on sort of how you're feeling as we uh, look at this uh, back 25 years ago this week. Yeah, thank you very much, Connor, and, and thanks to, to Dermot, and uh, de delighted to, to join with you, and I'm very impressed with all you're, you're doing with our studies, and, you know, it's, it's great that you're um, participating in so much, so much work and so much action, bringing so many young people to uh, together and um, uh, that, that we have an opportunity to uh, look at Irish issues in, in the way that you you make possible. Um, I, I suppose as, as we look back, as you said, 25 years is always a, a good period to reflect back on. It's been long enough uh, to be able to uh, see how things have worked and to remember and, and short enough that we that a lot of us are around that can still remember it so it's um as anniversaries go into the future that that that'll be uh won't be the case so we still have the original group except for some very noticeable um deaths that we'd along the along the way but i i, I think as we like it, after all the years of the troubles i suppose for people who are not that familiar i mean the troubles or this this phase of the trouble started in 1968 and you know up to 1998, so we were you know 30 years into it, and by and large the troubles had dictated life. Uh, there wasn't many years that it wasn't the the key issue. Sadly, most of the time built around deaths and bombs and shootings and mayhem and economic turmoil and you know a lack of investment and so almost everything that could go wrong in the society went went wrong for that about 30 years. Um, and I suppose uh, the opportunity of, of the, you know, the Good Friday Agreement was that it, it brought together, uh, I think the two words I always use is that was inclusive in so far as we, we got, you know, everybody more or less in. And if we didn't get them in at the start, we got them in by the St. Andrews Agreement in 2006. So we got everyone into a political process. Um, Yes, there's been stop starts, and you know we we come back to that later on. But uh, I I think um, that inclusivity was good because everybody loyalists, unionists, republicans, nationalists felt that they were part of the equation. They had a voice. They they were elected, uh, and we had people who were probably in between the people of the women's coalition and um, the alliance party who, who wouldn't see themselves necessarily as. As, as one side or the other. So I, I think that that has been good. The second thing that was good, and this was the Tony Blair and, and my plan, and so far as we had a plan, um, uh, because a lot of this thing, it, it just drifted as we went. But they, what we had discussed in, in opposition, uh, when he was leader of the opposition, 90, 
96, 95, 96, and I was leader of the opposition, was that if we got the opportunity from the people to lead our respective governments, we would try to make an inclusive process uh, and we would try to make it as comprehensive as possible. Um, and comprehensive was all the issues that had to be dealt with, at least. Uh, we might not have got all of them, but we, we certainly got a lot of them. We, we had to deal with you know, decommissioning of arms, demilitarization of Northern Ireland, uh, reform of policing, um, you know, dealing with the the amendment of the legislation that had been there for so long because there was a lot of draconian legislation by necessity because of the years of the trouble. Um, so I, I think we 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 went through that list and we a lot of a lot of good things. I mean, Northern Ireland now is an excellent police force, you know, that has been uh, seen internationally as a, and Chris Patton can take a lot of the Chris Patton former Tory minister, director of elections for the Tories, probably best known internationally and in America because of his role in Hong Kong. He's the one who negotiated that the Hong Kong arrangements, um, and and he did a fine job in that. And of course, the United States helped a lot in the policing uh, as, as well. Uh, Kathleen O'Toole. Uh, we played a big part in, in 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 that and helped us with our policing in the south as well. Um, so you know a lot of big big issues were were dealt with in the Good Friday Agreement. By and large, the 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 all the issues decommissioning took a bit longer than we wanted it to. It should have taken two years, took five, um, probably took seven actually before it was all totally wrapped up. But um. At least the arms were beyond use; they weren't being used, and and that probably was the big the big issue. It did become a bit of a political football, but uh, as as you know, colour as well as I do. But anyway, we we got there. Um, unfortunately, where we fell down, and I suppose it's reflecting that the politicians, the elected politicians, um, uh, at the moment, the DUP pulled down the um the institutions. Um, previously, Sinn Féin pulled down the, the institution, and early on, Secretary of State Mandelson pulled them down about Stormont Gate. Um, so, um, uh, and, and because I wasn't in Strand too, I didn't have the privilege of pulling them down. So I can't be, <laughs> I, I can't be blamed for that because I had no authority in that. <laughs> Maybe if I had, I would have pulled them down too. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I guess. Um, but th that's been the bad bit. That's been uh, on a serious note, uh, that's been the poor bit. That you know, we've gone probably half and half. A half where the institutions worked very well, and during the COVID, during the pandemic, they worked very well. They did a good job, in my estimation, good as any other country. Um, but on the other periods when they were down, it's been it's been very poor. Um, yeah. Uh, and the institutions, just for your audience who wouldn't be all familiar, but. The institution good fight agreement with the assembly, which is their parliament, their 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 executive, which is their their government, um, north south bodies, north south ministerial, where we work north and south together between Dublin and Belfast, and the east west. Uh, uh, that hasn't worked very well either because British prime ministers, mainly Boris Johnson, didn't bother to attend. So even when they had meetings, he didn't go. And that also led to a period where there was no meetings at all. So none of the institutions have worked to my satisfaction, Connor, or to what the aspiration was. But there were the politicians were involved in. All of the other things have worked well. Um, the policing reform is completed. Um, demilitarization is completed. Decommission was completed. The reform of legislation uh, has been really uh, excellent. They, you know, not only the Northern Ireland Act in 1998, but all those bills that came from that. Um, investment has improved a lot. Tourism, the North South bodies, and those issues have worked very well. As you know, you're in County Down there, and you know, there's a huge amount of you know cross border traffic now. The border kind of remains non existing. Um, uh, so the difficulties, uh, I, I, I should quickly say, Two things about the difficulties. One is that you know most of the times that the institutions fell down, it had nothing to do with the agreement. It was Mandelson because of Storm and Gate, which proved to be a puff of smoke. It was a bit of a a, a, a misnomer. Um, Cash for Ash was an environmental grant scheme that had nothing to do with constitutional issues. Um, and then Brexit and the backstop. 
uh, was all to do with Brexit and again had nothing to do with the constitutional issue. So, so unfortunately, our problems have emanated not from what you might have dreamt of 25 years ago or I would have dreamt of, but the issues that were unrelated. So um, I don't want to jump into the future because you want to talk about that later, but I think, but I think, I think that, yeah. Yeah, I think the 25 years has been successful, very successful from the peace process, from the other major issues, but politically it hasn't been. Yeah, and, and, and that really brings me into, I mean, and thank you, because I think that's a, that's a, a, a brilliant way, of, particularly for our US of bringing what was a, I think often we, we talk about the agreement without reminding people of how much the agreement covered. It covered so many areas of daily life for people from from policing and justice to the border to, as you say, the, the three sets of relationships, that is the, the relationships in Northern Ireland. Uh, between North and South and between Britain and Ireland. And I suppose I was listening to you there, thinking back to those early days. For me, there were three things that really demonstrated why the agreement was successful. Firstly, was that focus on relationship building. It's all about relationships. And when the relationships between the communities in Northern Ireland have worked well in the parish, then the, the institutions have worked well. When North-South bodies have worked well, People have benefited, for example, in areas like um, the oil and economy and tourism. And 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 thirdly, you know, at the British Irish level, I was actually thinking today it's nine years this week since the historic visit by President Michael D. Higgins to Queen Elizabeth II in Britain. And I had the privilege of, of being uh, there that week and seeing what I call a high point of British Irish relations, where it seemed anything was possible in terms of those relationships. So I think for me, one of the big, big lessons is if you focus on building those relationships and they're all interlinked, the relationships north south uh, between the communities here and Britain are all interlinked and the more we work on those uh, the better we'll all be but i suppose you know one of the other things that we have to reflect upon and hearing the likes of yourself and and i i, I was with uh, the brilliant monica williams the other day i've heard people like john alderdice and obviously watching footage of the late hume and trimble and all the many great architects of our uh, peace process what you also have was a huge capacity of leadership there was a, a wonderful confluence of leaders, uh, it, both thinking of Clinton, yourself, Blair, in office at time. And there was also a focus on practicalities, which you touched upon in terms of, of policing, et cetera, focusing on the daily issues that affect people's lives. So relationship building, leadership, and practicalities was a way of making the agreement happen in the first place and making it work in those early days. Would you agree that it's those three things that are going to help unlock the current challenges as we look uh, forward? Yeah, I, I, I would, Connor. I, I, I think, um, unfortunately, uh, and this, I suppose, is a negative. Uh, I hope we're coming out of the cycle. Um, the relations between the Irish government and the British government uh, sunk to, to very bad depths. And not not me saying it, but I think we, we've, we heard the Taoiseach and the Tarnished and the foreign foreign minister last year saying that that things were at an all time low, and um, I that I felt was very sad, quite frankly, because you know when it was Tony Blair and I, or even Gordon Brown later on, or you know, a, you know, the, the, there were very good relations, and uh, I I think Rishi Sunak, in fairness to him, um, has changed the dial as they say nowadays, uh, in a huge way, and and. Uh, he is genuinely, you know, he, he'll be in Northern Ireland tonight to meet uh, President Biden. Um, uh, he's going to be in Northern Ireland again next week to meet a lot of us. And uh, he's putting in the hours. Um, uh, I won't say anything bad about Boris. We'll just move on. So, um, it, it, so these are the things that are important as you say the the, the relationship so um hopefully we're, we, we've come through that that cycle uh it, connor you, you watched closely as i did you know when we had seamus mallon and david trimble you know in the early years they, it, it wasn't perfect but they were working hard at it and it was the early years and then we had we had um uh mark mcginnis and ian paisley that worked very well, um, exceptionally well. Everyone was shocked that it worked so well. 
And then we moved on to Peter Robinson, uh, Dean McMartin, which went very well. So, so there has been really, you know, I, I'd like to stress the positive rather than the negative. So it, we know it can work. We, we know it can work really well. And even during the pandemic, um, where, you know, where we Arlene and Michelle, you know, it worked well too. It might have been yeah. a bit more tension, but so I think you're correct. Uh, it is re relationships and people, and but I think this is what Northern Ireland deserves, you know. And I, I think the ordinary Joe and Mary Soap on the street, this is what they expect, and this is what they deserve. And hopefully, we'll get back to that. I hope I absolutely agree, uh, Birdie. But one of the things before we sort of look at some of the, the, the where we are sort of now, I just want to touch on is obviously, uh, and particularly noting uh, our audience today. The, the role of the United States in um, being a supporter, a trusted friend, a convener of the peace process was hugely important, to, both in terms of President Clinton's input, but of course, the, the 700 days of service that Senator George Mitchell gave to all of us as the chair of the All Party Talks. Perhaps you just reflect a little bit on the, the importance of the U.S. relationship, and particularly as as Tisha could say what, what that meant to, to you and and why that was important. Yeah, no, listen, it 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 was immense, and um, I always believe, Connor, that to make progress on the North, we had to internationalize it, um, and all the way from the seventies, there were attempts made for that to happen. You know, um, Minister Hillary, Paddy Hillary. When he was Minister of Foreign Affairs back in the early 70s, went to the UN, uh, went to the, to the US and tried to get uh, traction and that didn't happen. Um, but from, when, from the, the 90s, when uh, President Clinton decided to, to give it you know, re real effort and real commitment, we had a, had a lot of our friends down the years. I'm not saying we hadn't. I mean, we tip O'Neill before that. Um, Ronald Reagan came here, you know, um, George Bush Sr. You know, we, we, we had a lot of friends down the years, but if, it, if I want to take it from, if I can, from like 30 years back. So we're, um, Bill Clinton uh, took a particular interest. He came to Ireland, the island of Ireland, several times during his presidency. That was the embassy, envy of countries all over the world, how he took so much interest in it. He gave us George Mitchell, who stayed for a number of years. Um, as I said earlier on, people like um, Casual Two were on the policing, and and, and um, uh, it, it, it was recognised by everyone that commission the time that she she gave to us. Um, the President Clinton gave the economic conference early on, uh, which helped to bring investment, and that's where the first artificial intelligence investment came into Belfast, which is doing really well. Um, we have American companies that John Hume got with Tip O'Neill way back to come into Derry. Um, so, so you know that that the hands, uh, the helpful hands of the United States have, have been uh, all over it. And you know, President Obama came came in his time, uh, you know, to, to give us a, a, a bit of help. So, like, it's been an extraordinary for a small island. And I keep on saying to people. And we we know we think we, we're we're everything, but there's only seven million of us, and <laughs> there's a lot of bigger places in the world in the two hundred plus countries that are linked to the UN. So I think that kind of hands on, and I think the President Biden's visit now, um, at a, a, a good time again. Um, I don't expect him to work wonders on on getting the executive up and running, but I think he he can work wonders in showing people the fantastic opportunity there is for Northern Ireland today, that they're in the island economy with, with us guys in the South. They're in the UK economy, which is a big economy. I know they're having their problems, but they're still a big, big economy. And they're in the EU economy. And Northern Ireland has a unique position. And I think with the help, which will be gratefully given and, and willingly given by the United States, this gives Northern Ireland a real opportunity. And I hope that that would be the emphasis of, of, of President Biden. I know he's a big interest in this. And as you know, Connor, maybe everyone doesn't realize because he hasn't been able to get fully functioning yet. Um, uh, but he's given us Joe Kennedy as economic envoy. 
Uh, and Joe was anxious to get going. And he, he, it's very hard for him to do that with no institutions, but he, he's still trying. And as soon as it, they, they get sorted out. So the United States, there's, there's not much else they can do, quite frankly. Um, they've been all over this and all over it. Um, certainly for the, the 30 plus years that I've been directly involved in it. Yeah, and, and I, I completely, from from the last number of years, particularly through this role and various other hats, I've worn the the importance of that trusted friend, as I see the United States, in terms of the island of Ireland, in terms of all the communities and all the traditions of this island, it just remains hugely, hugely important. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the things, um, probably, you know, living in Northern Ireland, someone who uh, grew up, uh, born here, grew up in England, my child moved back uh, just before the Good Friday Agreement. We were only back a number of months, actually, uh, by the time of the Good Friday Agreement. In fact, the, one of the American companies that you referred to in Derry that uh, Hume helped bring uh, was actually the company my father ran in Derry. So part of the reason yeah. that, that we, we come back to, to home. Um, but for me, I've had the opportunity to watch the place I call home transform over the last 20 years. And it's, I've seen huge opportunity, but also as a human rights lawyer uh, and then in business, I saw the challenges too of this place, that the, the, the benefits of peace maybe weren't equally spread. And I, I often describe where we're at now as kind of the, a time uh, in between, an in-between time and in an in-between place. Uh, there's lots of great things. I'm so proud of Northern Ireland, I'm so proud of home, I'm so proud of all the opportunities and transformation there's been, but there's of course still challenges remaining. And you know, one of the words, and, and, and I promise we're not going to go down a, a rabbit hole of Brexit in this conversation, but it is a conversation anytime I come to Los Angeles, and particularly with my friends at the Irish American Bar Association, the issue of Brexit did put uh, the island of Ireland back on the agenda, I think, both in Europe and, and, and very much uh, in the United States. So perhaps we could just briefly talk about, and, and I agree with you, that hopefully with the Windsor framework, we're coming out the other side. It's focused on building relationships. It's focused on trying to make, I've always said, how do you make the Good Friday Agreement and Brexit compatible? Hopefully the Windsor framework is an attempt to do that. Do, 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 what, what's your view in terms of, of Brexit and, and where Northern Ireland, the island of Ireland goes from here? Yeah, well, Connor, I suppose there, there's no way of dealing with Brexit other than maybe being very blunt about it. <laughs> it was a disaster um, for, for the island of Ireland and for Northern Ireland in particular. Uh, uh, things that we had done and dusted and put down into the, um, into the archives uh, all of a sudden uh, revive themselves in, in, in the middle of 2016. Like the issue of the border had, 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 like there was no discussion about it. There was nobody talking about checks and, you know, where the lines down the Irish Sea or lines across Ireland or lines anywhere. Um, uh, that, that issue was gone. And um, unfortunately, Brexit, um, and in fairness, I suppose, rather than saying anything that I said or Enda Kenny said at Taoiseach at the time, uh, Tony Blair uh, and John Major from either sides of the Tory and the Labour Party uh, both made strong speeches and strong interviews pointing out that if people voted for Brexit, that it would cause a major problem in the island of Ireland. So, so I, I'm not going to take any credit for anything I said. They said it. and um, But it, it, they were ignored. Uh, they were ignored by the, the London press and ignored by uh, by the people. Uh, and then, you know, I, I know the people in, in, in the UK are entitled to vote whatever way they like on, on, on things. But anyway, you know my view about Brexit. Um, so anyway, but it, it did open up and it opened up the whole question about, you know, Irish unity. Would there be a border poll? Would there be a plebiscite? Um, you know, lines across the Irish Sea, checkpoints at customs posts during on the border, what happened in earlier years, you know, what the IRA campaign of 56, 62 were about, like things that we hadn't talked about for, for a few generations. And um, they all came back to play. And it has taken us, I suppose, not to go on about it, uh, Connor, because you said take it briefly, but um, it, it, it's taken us all of this time, all of, 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 of seven years, except for the last six months. And I do give credit um, to Margaret Kovas, the, the Vice President of the European Union Commission, 
uh, who's been responsible for the talks in the last number of years, and Rushi Sunak, who have pulled us out of that. Um, and now we seem to be back in a positive framework. And while while there might be a bit of argument about the, the Windsor Agreement, um, I don't think we need to go into that. I, I see it uh, that it's 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 almost perfect. There are probably a few bits that need to be sorted out. So let's not argue about the few bits. Let's let's try and sort out the few bits and you know, DFP have a few reservations. So let's try and sort that out and 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 then we can move on. But Brexit, Brexit to to put it in a line, it it, it it was just a disaster for what we were trying to achieve. And the one thing, when we were negotiating, I can say this to your audience and on the record, when we were negotiating through the years, all the way from 1990, from 91, 92 talks and, you know, into the Down Street Declaration, and I was around for all of those meetings of the cabinet, that and the framework document when we were out of government but all those discussions the one issue that was never ever ever mentioned by anybody was what would happen if the uk would pull out of the european union that was never mentioned but anyway listen hopefully we're over the hill connor and then um, you know let, let's get on with it but it 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 it, it messed us up for seven years that there be no mistake about that well, as I, I put it as simply as this, if, if the peace process and, and as somebody who grew up as a generation uh, post Good Friday Agreement, it was about taking the border of identity question out of our daily politics. And unfortunately, Brexit is all about borders and identity. So it, it was always going to be a challenge. And, and like yourself, and I, think I, I came before I entered in politics into, from the business world, so it was always very focused on pragmatism and how to find opportunity for crisis. And I hope that the proposition that Northern Ireland now has, whereby it has the unfettered access to both the yeah, GB UK market and the European Union market, uh, will actually give us an incredible global proposition in terms of our investment proposition. Uh, in mm. fact, probably to the to the to the, to the envy of of Wales, Scotland, and dare I say even even the South, who 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 don't mm -hmm. all have that unfettered access. So, and I hope. I suppose like, it's we, important to say, it. yeah. I suppose it's important to say, Connor, for people that will will listen and, and, and watch this, and that you know the 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 constitutional position or the identity position of Northern Ireland, um, as per the agreement, uh, can now only be solved or changed or amended by the people of Northern Ireland. It's on the basis of consent. Um, in the absence of violence and, you know, if, if whenever it happens, um, no changes unless the, the people vote for, for, for that change. And in the meantime, people from Northern Ireland can be either Irish, British or both. Um, so, th so that that issue which Brexit brought back into it, you know, was unfortunate. But the reality is different. The reality is that on the basis of consent, that there is a way of dealing with these issues if it ever has to be dealt with. And the future will determine that. Absolutely. And I completely concur with that. And one of the things, Bernie, I've heard uh, in recent months, um, uh, I think uh, Sir Jeffrey Donaldson, uh, whom I hold the highest personal regard, I think actually cited you as 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 being a good Taoiseach, as being someone who listened to the concerns of of unionism, and it is obviously is in as this process of Brexit and indeed how we restore the institutions um, continues. You, know, I suppose, what are your reflections in terms of, and I think particularly thinking of, of the role of the US, what more should we be doing or thinking in terms of engaging and respecting and understanding unionism um, particularly at this time yeah i i i think I, i've been of the view i i took kind of the unionist position on the um on the on the issue of brexit because uh you know the seven points but if you narrow the seven points they they really came down to um that northern ireland uh wanted to to be able to be part of the UK internal market uh, without having to uh, take these restrictions directly from the European Union because they weren't going to have members elected to the European Parliament anymore. And I thought that was a fair position uh, that, uh, you know, if, if you're in Northern Ireland, if you're where you are in, in, in County Down um, uh, and you're importing something from Manchester, 
um, why should you be so having to abide by EU regulations and EU strictures, uh, providing um, you're not sending it on to somewhere else, you're not putting it to somewhere else in the European Union. And I think the uh, I think we've now dealt with that issue. There might be a few a few um, you know little bits that have to be sorted out, but by and large, I think it's dealt. And the the other issues around the seven point plan, I think, have been fairly well dealt with as well. I'm not saying a hundred percent, but you never really get a hundred percent in these negotiations. I think it's fairly well tied down. So uh, ho ho hopefully, any other loose ends can 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 be sorted out. Um, I, I, but I think the big thing, the big thing for for Northern Ireland, is yes, sort out. Uh, and to help unionists sort out these issues, I, I'm all up for that. And there is no good us going on arguing about it. I'm, I want to see the institutions up. So let's try and find a way of doing it. I'm not sure we get much more change out of the European Union on these issues, but maybe the British government can give some cover if it's necessary that the order, as any outstanding issues are codified through EU or through UK law rather than EU. I, I, I'm up for that if that's doable. Um, and it, it let let us let us move on with that. So I think, and then uh, on the other side of it, I hope unionists then buy into the institutions, including North South, because there's so much we can do uh, through the North South arrangements. I mean, you know, we we have a big economy in the South now, huge multinational setup, and you know, it it makes just total sense. Um, and it's nothing to do with you know control or anyone controlling anything. Just that we can get on and 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 do business together. And you know, one of the things I'd love to see, Connor, that you know you have so many graduates, particularly from unionist backgrounds, have traditionally left and went to college outside of Northern Ireland. That you see more of them stay in Northern Ireland in the two fine universities that are there, and that they would come work in the south as much as the north, rather than having to go elsewhere. So I, I think these are these are things that make eminent sense and far bit easier for families to operate that way too. Absolutely, and look, and and, and what you you've sort of outlined there is, I suppose, and I say way to where we want to finish this conversation, which is looking to the future. But I suppose to get to the future, we have to build to build the bridge. And one of the dilemmas I think that we face, and I know certainly, uh, you know, being involved in politics now here is the dilemma between how to reform in the present to make things work better, whilst also respecting there are legitimate constitutional aspirations to either remain in the United Kingdom or to envisage some kind of new or united Ireland. What, what is your advice or your view on how you strike that, that tentative balance, that, that, that it's a, it is a balancing act between looking at how we can do things better because you know, as it's often said, you can create institutions, you can create peace agreements, but changing the hearts and minds of people is a whole other piece of work. Changing attitudes is the really hard piece uh, of peace building. Um, so how, how do we uh, do the reform and how do we also allow people to express their legitimate constitutional uh, desires or um, you know, what, what they aspire to? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the Good Friday Agreement set it out. I mean, it was a balance between union and unity. Um, and, and, you know, th th that balance was that there were the consent policy applies, no change until people decide otherwise. Um, but there was an aspiration clearly set out, and it, it needed to be in the agreement that from time to time there could be polls that would determine the level of support uh, for that. There hasn't been one in 25 years, um, thankfully, because I think it would have been unhelpful, quite frankly, and I always spoke against it. Um, I think there will be one in the future, but I have two provisos on that. Uh, one, that it should not be till the institutions, all the institutions have been sustainable and working effectively for a prolonged period. That's number one. And a prolonged period, I'm not putting years on that, but a prolonged period, not six months or a year, you know, it has to be a prolonged period. And secondly, that the preparatory work that makes sense of a new Ireland, I like to say a, a new Ireland rather than United Ireland, that that is set out so that people can see if the political system, or if it's not the political system, if it's academics, or because there is some academic studies going on now, 
and people are working hard on that, that they can set out the case. And then people can make a judgment um, on, a, on a logical case. And, um, you know, God forbid we ever go back and have another referendum like Brexit um, uh, that uh, they decided to bring the UK out of the United Kingdom. And about a year later, they decided to make the first speech how they do it. Um, well, maybe it was only six months in Lancaster House when Theresa May outlined it in January 2017 um, or in Scotland where they didn't work it out either. So if you're going to have a meaningful referendum about a serious issue, you have to have the, the work done. And on, the, on both those issues, on the first one, we haven't had stable institutions for any period. And secondly, we haven't worked out how the case would be made. So, you know, I, I, I think, in other words, Connor, I've been forthright in this, that um, the work should be done. But the idea of having uh, a referendum in the short term, in, in my view, is, is not going to happen. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, and uh, you know, I, one of my roles, obviously, here is I lead on the SDLP's New Ireland Commission, which is the think tank for the future. Yes. And the approach and how your approach has actually been a huge source of, of debate and thought as to how we, we go about even having this conversation. And I think one of the lessons from the, the, the work we've done over the last 18 months, right across the community, right across this island, including with the, the, the brilliant shared island unit, is to ensure that it, it, it's very much about um, having conversations, getting under understand each other, understanding the issues, thinking about practicalities, thinking about relationships, listening to hopes, fears and concerns, rather than obsessing about a date or a, a poll as the mechanism to bring about the change, because this is much bigger than that. This is about a conversation about the kind of society we want it to be. So uh, I think I agree with you. It's about how to create that space in which we can actually have that kind of conversation, because I know in the work that I'm doing recently with, with a group of loyalist women hosting a workshop with the New Ireland Commission, they were willing to engage because the conversation was about the kind of of uh, kind of society we want to be. Uh, we weren't trying to impose something upon them. And I think there's there's a huge piece of work to be done to articulate how we might have these conversations. I suppose the question is, how do we talk about the future? And you know, what is your advice to there's many groups, community groups, civic groups, business who are in this space? What's your advice to them about how we responsibly yeah. talk? The future. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, I, I really believe, Connor, that, you know, every every organization in the island of Ireland are sectoral groups, let's put it that way, whether they be cultural bodies, sports bodies, business bodies that are doing it already, whether they be Invest Order in Ireland, IDA, Chamber of Commerce, um, agricultural groups who are very good at doing these things, our farmers actually are quite always forward in cooperation, but that they all should be looking at how they cooperate. And I think what we need to try and get away from is that any level of cooperation or work isn't seen, that this is all the big plan uh, to have a, a, a united Ireland. Uh, because the difficulty is, if you don't get a buy-in from everybody, and I mean on this, I think the problem will be getting loyalists and unionists to buy in, that if they take the view, oh, this is the slippery slope. So if we do get involved, that this means um, it, it, it's, it's a united army. I, I take the opposite view. If they do get involved, they can influence how this will work out. They can influence what a new Ireland will look like. Or if there's not going to be no new Ireland, how, how we all live on this island on our own. So I think it, it's the engagements that will and the you know the protracted, dedicated engagement of everybody will ultimately throw up the solutions. Do we leave everything the way it is, or do we have a new Ireland, or, or what do we do? And I, you know, but it, it, we we all should be, uh, and, and 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 I'm into my seventies now, but we 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 all should be trying to see what is the uh, the kind of a life we want to leave for our grandkids. I mean. Let this generation is this generation, but let us look at the, those people who are coming through the education system. Let us look at those people who have been born today. I mean, what what is the the island of Ireland? We, there'll be far more people. Um, it's it's a far richer place, uh, and we want to make sure that it can establish itself in a in a good way. And you know, I I don't understand anybody saying they don't want to be part of that discussion. 
And because all you're doing is framing how it's going to look like, you're not deciding it because ultimately it'd probably be the next generation will make those decisions, but you're framing it and you're engaging in it and you're trying to make it a better place. And it's not all a trap. Like, to be honest with you, if, if I was asked to go to a meeting that's to set up a trap uh, to con unionists into a United Ireland, I wouldn't be at the meeting. If you asked me to go to a meeting that makes this a better island for my grandkids, I'd be first in the queue. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I look. I think uh, you 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 have brilliantly articulated. Uh, it is about the intention, and and I think what you're really talking about is what the agreement promised, which is reconciliation. And actually, um, if we approach this in the right way, the conversation about the future, if done in the right way, can actually be in of itself a process of reconciliation. If we if we enter into it in the spirit uh, of the of, of, of mutual respect and and recognizing the validity of both traditions and all traditions that 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 make up uh, this this island, so I, I, yeah, I and there's nothing that, there's nothing wrong, Connor, of you know of there having to be a, a new modern balance between unity and and and, and union. I'm, you know, there, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with, with that. I mean, we, you know, you and I and nobody else can change the fact that for several hundreds of years, um, we have two different identities uh, and the people see things different. Um, and we can, we can place that on an agenda that we're a divided island or Northern Ireland is a divided place uh, and that we can never go anywhere and it's going to stay that way forever. We can, we can place it that way. Or we can place it on the basis that we're going to try to work to make it the best possible place that we can uh, in the best possible circumstances. And the fact that the United States want to help us, European Union wants to help us, the rest of the United Kingdom wants to help us, uh, is, isn't, isn't that, aren't they huge positives? And, you know, that we're not being left to paddle our own canoe. So, you know, I, 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 I think, um, you know, the future is bright if, if we're bright. <laughs> Uh, well, it takes us in a full circle because when we began the conversation, we reflected that one of the successes of the agreement was in relationships and that the answers were found in building relationships, in exploring the potential of relationships, in that fostering of mutual respect. And in many ways, I think the conversation has taken us to the same, which is any future and the only future that we're interested in is one in, which is focused on, on relationship building and the possibility, as I, I, I agree with you, I think what is possible if we were to explore the relationships and all of the traditions on this side and what we could do together, it is it is yet to be imagined. And I'm conscious of time and I, I, I'm delighted the uh, Consul General to Los Angeles is, is with us and I want her to bring her in just a moment to say a few words in closing, but um, but it was just in, 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 in final uh, remarks, you know, um, sort of we're 25 years on um one never likes to look too far to but you know we're sitting 25 years from now the americans have a great expression of what does success look like well you know what what would uh, if we're if if there's a 50th anniversary of the agreement uh event you know what, what would success look like what would you what would you like to hear people saying at that that event yeah, I, I would. Number one, I'd like to see a peaceful island. I, I'd, I'd like to see that um, uh, people's political aspirations, whatever they are, um, and whether they're orange or green or whether they're somewhere in between, um, that, that people can peacefully coexist uh, and that whatever political arguments are dealt with um, in whatever institutions, if it's still Dáil Éireann uh, or, or if it's still Stormont, um, uh, personally, I, I, I'd, I'd love to see uh, that we could find an accommodation uh, that would bring us all together in, in the New Ireland, uh, a, a New Ireland that is, is genuinely negotiated uh, by everybody, not imposed on anybody. Um, there's, no, there's no future in, in, in that. Um, and if that doesn't happen, the people can still um, put forward their aspirations uh, as per the Good Friday Agreement that you can argue your case. Uh, but more than anything else, I, I'd, I'd like to see that the potential that the island has um, across uh, creating a, a, a really wealthy, peaceful, 
you know, well educated. And I think we're well on the way to this now with great universities, great academic institutions that we can build on that even more and more. And, you know, if I was talking 25 years ago, I'd say, God, the troubles have created so much emigration. I can gladly say now that the that the, the absence of violence has brought immigration. Um, uh, I was in a, 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 a software place last week where there were um, something like 90 different nationalities in it. So, you know, I think they, they, I'd like to see that kind of continue where we can be really part of the, the world. And you know, we're, we're, we're seen around the world for our, our innovation and our enterprise and our you know, creative art. Uh, artistic things that we, we're always famous with, not for the fact that we're involved in violence or troubles or arguments. So that's the kind of an Ireland I'd like to see. Well, it, it, it sounds like a, a great vision uh, for anyone which uh, chimes absolutely with myself. And I think it'd be remiss of me not to close uh, with, with a, a Heaney quote, which of course was written to capture the spirit of 1998 and, and many of the people listening will know it well when he said history says don't hope on this side of the grave but then once in a lifetime the longed for tidal wave wave of justice rises up and make hope and history rhyme and I just want to say to you thank you uh, Tisha current Birdie for being part of making hope and history rhyme in the great leadership you demonstrated during the agreement and 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 in the 25 years since uh, for your continued leadership it's deeply appreciated as somebody who has made a, a life here in Northern Ireland. I, I am one of the, the, the many beneficiaries of the sacrifice that you and the Good Friday Agreement generation made. And I hope that we will honour you and your generation by continuing to find ways to make hope and history rhyme. Um, but I'm very grateful to you for the conversation today. It's been a, an absolute privilege and I'm sure everybody uh, who has joined us uh, has uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I'm going to ask just before we let you go, uh, because I know you are a man in demand uh, this week, uh, if I'm going to ask uh, Marcella Smith, I think is there, who is the uh, Irish Consul General to Los Angeles, who has been a great supporter of uh, Irish studies and, and this fellowship. And if Marcella's there, I'd love to ask Marcella just to say a few words in, in closing. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connor. Yes, indeed, I, I'm here and have been been glued uh, to the screen and, and, and listening so very closely to this brilliant and fascinating conversation. And thank you so much, um, Mr. Hearn. Thank you, Connor, for, for today's conversation. Uh, and thank you to, to Ellen Yu for, for hosting. Um, it is you know, so important that we continue to have these conversations. You know, and I think what was very clear from, from listening to the discussion today, you know, the journey to where we are now, it, it's obviously, it's been a very difficult one. It's, it's seen many, many challenges, um, challenges that we're, we're still continuing to face. But what's changed is that we have a roadmap to help navigate those challenges and an agreed set of tools to find our way back when our, our efforts might, might go astray. And also just to pick up on one or two of the points that that, that you made, Mr. Hearn and, and, and also you, Connor, you know, that the Good Friday Agreement, it wasn't, you know, the, the creation or the vision of just one tradition, but of both. Um, and I think the progress that we have won, it really has been achieved through the leadership, not of, of one individual, not of one tradition, um, but but of both and of, and of, of, of many, you know. Um, and as President Biden is currently flying uh, across the, the Atlantic, um, I think it, it behoves us also to, to recognize and acknowledge the incredible important role that the US has played in helping us achieve um, the, the agreement and helping us develop that process and that road, road to peace. I, I also was really struck by what you said, uh, Mr. Hearn, in relation to sort of identity, and I think that's such an important, uh, an important point to make. You know that there, are, to recognise that Northern Ireland has seen such significant growth um, since the the agreement uh, or was achieved, and you know there are so many who do not wish to be seen as nationalist or unionist. So that Northern Ireland really is now um, a society of uh, multiple and complex identities. So we, we have to remember that as we look to, to the future. And I think that future question is, is incredibly important. 
know, um, and but also what's really important is remembering that the Good Friday Agreement, it remains our engine and our vehicle for the process of peace and reconciliation on the island of Ireland. It's, its values, its visions, they, they're really central to how we approach our relationship within and between the islands. Oh, and this 25th anniversary, it's an opportunity for all of us collectively to recommit ourselves to the agreement's values and commitments. And it is, as we've been doing today, an occasion as well to sort of ask ourselves important questions about what we must do to bring the dividends of peace to all communities that still struggle with the legacy of the, the troubles. Um, and so we have to reflect on what has happened in the past, but also look as to what still remains to be achieved. You know, as I said, Northern Ireland has changed profoundly in the 25 years since the agreement was signed, but that appetite for peace, um, that appetite for a prosperous future, it has not. And I think the Good Friday Agreement remains the foundation for a hopeful future as we look to what the current generation of young leaders and peace builders will achieve in the next 25 years. So I want to thank you so much for, for today, for helping us to, to be able to challenge ourselves in that way, for helping us to continue having the, those conversations. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that when we're coming in another 25 years to be talking a, a, a about Ireland, that we are doing so in a very different context and in a very different manner. Thanks, Marcella. Thank you. Thank you again, Brody. Thank you everyone for being here.